All right, welcome to this video on the book of Philippians. Uh, you've already watched the Bible Project video introducing the book of Philippians, and in this video, we just want to go a little bit more in depth uh, into the content of this letter that Paul writes to the Philippian church. So just a little bit of background before we get into the content. First of all, notice the audience and background here. Paul founded this church. He planted this church on the second missionary journey, which is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 16. The next thing to note about Philippi is that there was no synagogue in this city. Usually Paul would go to a city and begin in the Jewish synagogue, but in this case, there was no synagogue. So most of the converts to Christianity in the city of Philippi were Gentiles, in fact, most all of them. Uh, there are three significant converts. If you read Acts chapter 16, uh, the first one is Lydia. She's a businesswoman, and uh, she's a wealthy woman and a Gentile, but she becomes a Christian. The second significant convert is a slave girl, uh, and she's demon-possessed. Paul casts a demon out of her, and she becomes a believer. And then the third significant convert is the Philippian jailer. And this is a, a pretty well-known story from Acts 16, where Paul and Silas are put into prison in Philippi, and uh, the Philippian jailer uh, becomes a Christian and a believer through the witness of Paul and Silas. So... Lydia, uh, the slave girl, and the Philippian jailer, all, all Gentiles, but all became believers in Jesus Christ. Of course, there must have been many more converts uh, in Philippi, but in Acts 16, our author Luke there tells about these three as representative of the church in Philippi. So why does Paul write this letter? What's the purpose? Well, mainly it's a thank you note. Uh, for a gift that was sent to him while he was in prison. Remember, this is one of the prison epistles. Paul is in prison in Rome, and this was a Gentile church. Uh, very wealthy people lived in this town, and apparently they had sent Paul a sizable monetary gift to support his ministry in Rome, and Paul is writing a, this letter just to say thank you for what you've done. Uh, he mentions Epaphroditus. Uh, in this book. Epaphroditus is the person who brought the gift from Philippi to Paul in Rome, and we read in this book that he did so at great risk to his own life, and it was quite a sacrifice for him to do that. So Paul is very grateful, and he's saying thank you in this letter to the Philippians. Uh, he also writes to tell them that Timothy will come to them soon, and that, in fact, Paul himself hopes to get released from prison and visit them as well. And then thirdly, and this gets to the content of the book, Paul is writing to show them that true joy comes from Jesus Christ alone. And so that ends up being the theme of this book of Philippians. It's a book about joy, the joy of the gospel, and that true joy, true contentment, true satisfaction can only come from the gospel and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, here you see the map, and this is where Philippi is. That's the church that Paul is writing to in this letter. Uh, here's the map of his second missionary journey, and there's Philippi, uh, and that's the church. And then, of course, Paul went on to Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth, and he wrote letters to some of those churches as well. Uh, just some brief photographs of the city of Philippi there. You see some of the archaeological excavations that are taking place in ancient Philippi. It was down in a valley, you can see, surrounded by mountains. There's a little bit closer view of those excavations. Uh, here uh, is a photograph of a famous highway, the Ignatia Way. And you're looking at some of the stones here. This actually, in its day, was a major highway. Uh, connecting these major cities, and, and these stones are the actual stones from 2,000 years ago that Paul would have walked on and, and represented a major highway. And there you see the stones again. If you look closely, you can kind of see a groove right here in those stones, and that groove was put there by uh, the repeated uh, rolling of chariot wheels over that area. So those are the actual stones from 2,000 years ago, 
that Paul traveled on. This is the traditional site of Paul's prison cell in Philippi. He was he and Silas, as I said, were put into prison there, and and uh, it was during that time that the Philippian jailer came to faith in Jesus Christ. So what's the theme of the book of Philippians? Well, I mentioned already, really, in just one word, uh, the theme of Philippians is joy. Just joy in the gospel. And here's the theme verse in Philippians 4, verse 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. So joy is the theme. But just a reminder that Christian joy is something different than happiness. You know, happiness is something that you have that's sort of a good feeling that you have that's based on circumstances. Something goes well in your life and you're happy. But joy is something that you can have in all circumstances, and it never changes. Here's kind of a, a simple little definition of joy that I think is really good. Joy is the settled assurance that even though the roof of your life is caving in, life is okay at the center because God is in control. Now remember the circumstances under which Paul writes this letter. Remember, he's in prison. Uh, he's, he's not a free person, and he's in jail. And yet, Paul can write from that prison cell that he's experiencing joy, because even jail and suffering cannot change the truth of the gospel and the joy that he feels in his Christian life. So joy is the theme of this letter. So how does Paul demonstrate that in these four short chapters in the book of Philippians? Well, let's look at chapter 1, first of all, where Paul says that there is joy in suffering. Now, that's kind of an unusual thing to say, but Paul says it, and I think it actually can be true. We can have joy in suffering. He says, first of all, adverse circumstances actually serve to advance God's purposes, and therefore... Paul can have joy about the purposes of God, the church of Jesus, going forward, even when things are bad for him. Here's an example in the text of Philippians, chapter 1. Paul says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In other words, Paul being in prison is actually serving the gospel. Paul goes on to say that, the whole palace guard uh, is aware that he is in chains for Christ. In other words, the Roman guards who are, who are in charge of Paul and guarding him are aware that he's a Christian, and apparently Paul, as a prisoner, is preaching the gospel to them. That's amazing. There is joy in suffering, advanced circumstances, advance the gospel. Paul goes on to say that bad motives cannot thwart God's purposes. Here he says that some are preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry. Uh, apparently what happened is that uh, some people found out that Paul was in prison, and so they kind of took up that space of preaching in the church and were sort of trying to make a name for themselves uh, because of their preaching. But Paul ends up saying the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. So it doesn't matter if Paul is getting the credit or somebody else is getting the credit. The important thing is that the kingdom of Jesus and the church is going forward, and Paul rejoices in that. Here in chapter 1, verse 21, Paul expresses his zeal and motive, even in the midst of suffering. He says in chapter 1, 21, he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So he says, If I live... I live to Christ. If I die, well, that's okay too, because I gain. So there is even joy in suffering. Here in chapter 3, Paul says, uh, this goes to his zeal and motive as well. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What Paul wants to know is he just wants to be more like Christ and know Christ, and he wants to know the power of new life. And that's possible, he says, even in the midst of suffering. 
So there is joy in suffering. Uh, Paul then goes on to say to the Philippians that you are called to suffer for Christ. And so you should remain faithful even in the midst of suffering. Here he says, he says, conduct yourselves in a worthy manner. Uh, he says, without being frightened and know that you will also suffer. So as a Christian, we should expect suffering, but even in the midst of suffering, the most important thing is that the church is served, the gospel is preached, and we can experience joy even under those circumstances. So let's move on to Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says that there is joy in serving. There is joy in serving each other and the church and, of course, serving Jesus Christ. Now, the way he demonstrates this joy in serving is that he is probably quoting a hymn that was already in existence about the person of Jesus Christ. And this poem or this hymn as you learned in the previous video, stands at the very center of this book of Philippians. It's a poem about Jesus Christ, but it's a poem that's an example of how we should find joy in serving. Uh, here's the poem in Philippians 2. Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Well, what kind of attitude was that? Well, he says, that Jesus, even though he was in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So Jesus is equal with God. But notice, he made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, found an appearance as a man, humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Paul is showing that through the example of Jesus that even though he was in a position of being equal with God, he was willing to go down and to make himself less in order to accomplish the mission of God, the salvation of human beings. He became obedient to death on a cross. And then God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus' willingness to go down and to serve was rewarded by him giving, being given a place of honor. And so Paul says that should be our attitude as followers of Christ. We should be willing to go down and maybe even lose on purpose and, and, uh, and suffer ourselves. Uh, in order to help and serve somebody else, because that's exactly what Jesus did. So just to summarize that poem, notice that there are really seven demotions, or steps of going down, that Jesus took in order to serve uh, human beings in our salvation. Equal with God, he emptied himself, became a servant, became a human, uh, People recognized him as a mere human or a man. He humbled himself to death. And then even death on a cross, which was the most excruciating and painful way to die. And so I think what Paul is saying is really this is, this is the primary way that the church goes forward and that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is built. That is that some people are willing to serve and go down uh, and experience discomfort on behalf of somebody else. You know, a lot of times we think we can, we can advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ and at the same time find winning and upscale and, and advantages, but I think that actually is quite false. The only way that the kingdom of Jesus Christ goes forward is if somebody somewhere is willing to do a little dying. But of course, in the process of dying and serving somebody else in that way, there is true joy that can be found. So Paul goes on to say that uh, the Philippians and us in our service ought to shine like the stars. Here's the text in Philippians 2. He says, continue to work out your salvation. Do everything without complaining so that you can become blameless and pure. And then here's the phrase, 
shine like the stars. That is our Christian service, our service to one another and to the church ought to shine so that other people notice it and are attracted to it uh, because of what we're doing. And then finally in chapter two, he gives the example of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is an example of one who served and went through great pain. Um, remember, he's the one who brought the gift from Philippi to Paul in Rome. And along the way, he almost died. Here's the text. He says uh, about Epaphroditus was ill and almost died. Uh, he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life uh, for the sake of the gospel. So Paul says that's how we ought to act as well, be willing to serve. In fact, give our lives for the sake of the gospel, and that in the process, there can be joy. Let's move on to chapter 3, where Paul says that there is joy in believing. There is joy in our faith and the trust that we have and the things that we believe. Uh, for example, Paul says we ought to believe in grace and not legalism. Uh, obviously, there's great joy in the grace plan. Uh, if we're going to try to be saved and form a relationship with God by obeying the law and, and through legalism, that's just going to result in being a burden. And it's going to create depression and anxiety. But the grace plan, just believing in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, brings great joy. Paul gives an example from his own life. He says, Look, he says, if I was going to try to earn a relationship with God through legalism and through the things that I have accomplished, he says, well, I've accomplished more than anybody else. And here he lists several things. He says, I was circumcised. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. I had zeal in persecuting the church. I'm Torah observant. He said, yet all of these things we're not able to create a relationship of joy with God. In fact, he says in chapter 3 here, he says, I consider all these other things rubbish. In fact, the Greek word that translates rubbish is the Greek word skubala. It's kind of a strong word that, well, maybe you know what skubala means. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker, skubala happens. Yeah, that's a strong word. Uh, for human excrement, actually. Paul says, all of my effort, all of my accomplishments are just garbage and just a burden. We need to find joy in believing in the grace plan. And then he says, there's joy in believing in the resurrection. In Philippians 3, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And of course, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that brings the most joy to our lives because it means that we get new life and we anticipate our perfect new lives in the new heavens and new earth. Of course, Easter is approaching when we, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and maybe that's the most joyful Christian celebration of all. And Paul says, yeah, that's what I want. I wanna believe in the resurrection. Paul then says, there's joy in believing in a future hope of transformation, that not only are we saved by grace, but he says, I can have great joy in knowing that my whole life is going to be transformed and changed so that I can actually reflect perfectly the character of God. Here he says, he says in Philippians 3, he says, I've not already obtained this, you know, this transformation, or have already been made perfect, he says, no, far from it. But he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. He says, I haven't taken hold of it yet. But he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. He says, I press on to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we can continue to move forward, knowing that the goal is, is to be made like Jesus Christ and his character. And then finally he says, there actually is joy in believing in the law of obedience. In other words, Paul says there's actually joy in obeying God and keeping you know, his moral rules that we find in scripture. 
You know, a lot of Christians today say, well, you Christians have all these rules. How depressing is that? Well, Paul says just the opposite. He says, actually, there can be great joy in obeying the rules and obeying God because that's the way life was meant to be lived according to God's plan and his rules. Finally, Paul says in Philippians 4 that there is joy in giving. There's joy in giving and uh, giving, first of all, to each other. Uh, here in chapter 4, Paul gives the example of two women, uh, Yodia and Syntyche, uh, in the church at Philippi. And he said apparently there was some sort of conflict uh, between these two. And Paul says that they ought to instead give love to one another and not live in conflict or contention. Uh, secondly, he says that we ought to give joy to each other. And here's the theme verse in Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. In other words, we ought to let the joy that we feel inside be evident to everybody around us. He says, let it be evident to all. I think if Christians go through suffering, one of the best witnesses that we can have to other people is is, uh, is the way that we respond to suffering uh, by demonstrating the joy and the contentment that we can have, even in the midst of suffering, not responding with anger, not responding with anxiety, but responding with joy. What a great witness that is. And then Paul says that another thing that we can give is moral purity. And here he says, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about these things. And so we ought to consider uh, the pure and moral way of life and that we ought to think about that and fill our minds with that so that we can actually end up acting that way and reflecting those thoughts in our own character. So we ought to give moral purity as an example to people around us, but also as a way to experience joy ourselves. Then finally, he says we ought to give generous gifts. Uh, apparently, the Philippians had given a very generous gift to Paul in support of his ministry, uh, and Epaphroditus was the one who delivered it. And there can actually be joy, Paul says, in the giving of gifts uh, to one another. Here he says, uh, you shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving. I don't know if you've ever given a gift to somebody, but you can actually experience joy yourself when you do that. And Paul says, we ought to do that more often in the church. So finally, uh, this book of Philippians is really about just that word joy, experiencing Christian joy in different ways. Joy in suffering, joy in serving, joy in believing, and then finally, joy in giving. And that's the book of Philippians.